Our first article is going to be presented and moderated by Dr. Adam Lee. All right. Thank you, Andrew. We'll go right to the videos. So share my screen here and get straight to it. Any questions you have, type in the box and I'll try to consolidate them and direct them towards Dr. Burgess once we finish the recorded video. We want to thank you, Dr. Burgess, for taking time to join us. Uh, the paper that was uh, selected is going to be looking at your paper from the Journal of Trauma uh, in 1990, looking at public ring disruptions, effective classification system, and uh, treatment protocols. And so, Dr. Burgess, if you could just start uh, discussing um, what was the basis uh, for this uh, study? Well, we were blessed by the um early 80s and late 70s, but starting in around 1980, 81 and 82 to uh, be in the first, sort of the early version of a totally dedicated trauma center, what became a level one trauma center. It was an abandoned hospital in Baltimore. And, and what came uh, to our benefit was the physical location of the plant put our trauma operating rooms literally across the hall from the resuscitation area. The second thing that happened is uh, we got most of the major pelvic ring disruptions in, in a two or three state area with the center being in Baltimore. Uh, helicopter retrieval, uh, about 50% of our patients was uh, a large amount. 70% of our patients came directly from the scene. And I think as important as anything, we would get called early out of the operating room for our feelings and physical um, uh, assessment of a pelvic fracture fairly early in the resuscitation stages of somebody that was uh, uh, that level of instability. And the second thing, which I now consider a blessing, is you only had a few tools. Um, CAT scan of pelvic fractures didn't exist. Interventional angio didn't exist. Um, and uh, you were left with or blessed with a physical exam, a set of vital signs, a radiograph, usually an AP pelvis, and if it was minutes or a half hour segments into it, the response to some of the early treatments like a fluid challenge, at that time saline or ringers, and very, very often a direct interaction with an EMT or helicopter medic that had been at the scene and could verbally describe um, high impact T-bone or lateral compression or a motorcyclist that had obviously gone over the handlebars with some of the AP um, injuries. At the same time, um, we were paying some attention to the early work of uh, Pinnell and Tile, which had classified anterior posterior compression, lateral compression injuries, vertical shear um, injuries at the pelvic ring. Then Jeremy Young, a radiologist who said, hey Burgess, you're calling these films lateral or AP compression because of this guy's Pinnell and Tile. I, I think we ought to classify the films that way. And, and we did that. And then the family started to have an, um, relative versions of this, that you could step up in, in what we thought was maybe perhaps the amount of violence. And we had this, we started, so this is a lateral compression. It's just kind of the sacrum crushed in a bit in an anterior transverse pattern. Why don't we call that a lateral compression too? The second type, this patient, he seems got a little ha harder. He cracked the ilium and brought it across a little farther. There's a little more lateral displacement anteriorly, but he's really got an iliac fracture attached to it. Why don't we call that a type two? And we had then this further thing where the patient had obviously, both by the history and by the way, by cl cutting clothes off and seeing tire tread marks and things like that, the patient who was entrapped against the, the surface and run over and some extremely high energy T-bone injuries, but both of those gave us what we started to call a lateral compression type three, LC3. The lateral compression injury on one side and an open book injury on the other. And we also knew what that meant to ligamentous tears and stuff like that due to some post-mortem work. And so we knew what ligaments had to be either spared or disrupted based on those films. And we did the same with the AP injuries. There were some where we had an opening of the pelvis in front, the symphysial, uh, an opening in, in the, where the two pubic bones met and it opened, but on physical exam, it, it, it didn't go much further. It had a stop point to it. We 
found that fairly rare, but we called it an AP1. And uh, another AP injury with uh, an SI joint or both open, but obviously on physical exam and even on plain films, the posterior ligaments were intact. So this was like a bind, a book injury to a book, but the posterior elements of the binder stayed intact. We call that an AP2. And then finally, where it was obviously an AP variant, things were swung open, but then complete disruption of the book binder, and we call that an APC3. And that rendered the hemipalpus completely unstable. Vertical shear seemed to be one family. We noticed on following falls from a height, actually only about 50% landed vertically, the other half landed on their side, but of the ones that landed vertically, uh, and with some uh, motorcycle and, uh, and car accidents with an extended limb, you got a vertical shear injury. So that was our family, and we started applying those, and we noticed as we went through them in detail, we started looking at records of some of these in a film uh, paper that preceded this was 373 of these injuries we looked at. And these families had a different set of associated injuries and some common sense would tell you, if you got hit hard from the side and lateral compression family, you often um, uh, manifested that with the solid viscous hitch in your abdomen, pulmonary contusion and broken ribs, and occasionally torn aorta. We were torn told that all aortas were torn in AP injury with the ligamentum taken, but about 17% of aortic injuries in cars are being hit from the side. And also a certain high uh, relevance if you were near side lateral impact with head injury, and usually that was B-pillar contact and, and was severe head injury, and occasionally um, the kind of head injury you get where you get shear at the, at, at the neuron level, although we didn't know that's what was happening to those people. They didn't have a always a skull fracture, but they had this inertial load that we would figure out later, but head injury was associated with lateral compression. And the same with AP. AP injury is giving you a, a, a bigger pelvic hematoma. When, when later on, we had the access to, inter, to uh, interventional angio, even for studies, BB, before we even treating people with clots or, 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 uh, or either artificial or not. Uh, but you could see the superior gluteal bleed be pretty much the, the leader in that. And the families became more and more obvious. As you just started to uh, develop these uh, patterns of injuries that you saw from the intake of patients, from the communication with EMS, uh, did that influence um, the treatment of these patients in your close relationship with the general surgeons as you saw these patients getting their uh, exploratory laparotomies? Were you then able to maybe direct some of their resuscitation efforts and uh, direct their, um, their care towards specific injuries based upon their, their pelvic uh, ring uh, disruptions? It's multiple uh, fights, literally, to gain some early orthopedic control. The second that you mentioned, and, uh, and I talk about too much, is somebody with an unstable pelvis to inexperienced hands and hemodynamically unstable. And you get the same feel to your physical exam with some lateral compression variants where you're, you're putting your hand on what's normal anatomy and when you feel the medial instability on rotation, you're really recreating the moment of impact. To a young ER doc or a young general surgeon, they'll get the same feel when they're reducing an APC2, let's say. They'll both feel unstable and they'll have a hemodynamic instability. If I'm present or my crew is, we will push to let us, if we realize it's an AP one, let us get some control of the pelvic ring. You, you, you probably have to go in there in the early days with your knife, later on with your angio catheter, but let me control the pelvis first. Whereas you're going to redirect somebody with a lateral compression injury. No, he's probably not bleeding. He's 22 years old and got a lateral compression hit pretty good. Are you sure he doesn't have a solid viscous or one of his pulmonary contusion broken ribs has got something bleeding in his chest? And so so very much so, our intervention directed some of the things. This needs a X fix or binder on the pelvis first before we do much else. This one will go second with a lateral compression stabilization, but you got to recheck the belly or the chest. That's yeah, awesome. So uh, another, another, I think, important thing that came out of your paper was uh, the resuscitation required uh, for certain pelvic ring injuries and uh, in terms of the blood units that were required uh, for resuscitation, specifically for the AP type injuries that required significantly more blood products. And so once you started to recognize that, how did that play into the resuscitation uh, of these patients 
we were getting to 30 something units for uh, an APC3. And one of the reasons the XFIX made its move to the OR or to the ER, or I had instant access to it, it was sterile, it was on the shelf. And we got these, AP, these fixers on quickly. We put on a fixture that would pro, pro, uh, allow a, a follow-up um, exploratory lap. It would allow exploration of a perineum. There were X-fixes that didn't get in the way much, even though they looked bulky. We could get them out of the way of the next step in resuscitation. You, you push a pelvis together and tie it with a sheet, or push a pelvis together and hold it together with an X-fix, or tie femurs together that are unfractured and, and by secondary intent bring the pelvic ring together. And the systolic blood pressure goes up. You could walk into a room, look at a pelvic film on the severe ones that was coming in unstabilized flat on a backboard and, and getting film, sometimes through the backboard, by the way, in our early protocols, we hadn't rolled them off yet because we hadn't cleared the spine fully. So we were shooting sometimes through wood, but if their pelvis was wide open and with regard to the X-ray, and maybe even a closed pelvic APC3, type of person for six, you really knew what your retroperitoneum was gonna be like. And also occasionally when you won or lost your battles with the general surgeons, and you were those early days when I was trying to say who was right and who was wrong when I knew it was a retroperitoneal bleed and they were arguing, I would scrub in as the first or second assist. And so when I was right and they had pushed me out of the way and didn't let me stabilize the pelvis first, I was calling them while we were in the belly because the blood, the, yeah, there were some uh, peritoneal bleeders, you know, mesenteric bleeders. But you were looking at a retroperitoneal just bulging out, staring you in the face. And it start, we started to get some orthopedic credibility to put in the protocols you read about in the paper. Dr. Burst, really appreciate your time uh, talking with us about your, your study. And uh, talk any... about the downs downside of this just before you hang up? Absolutely. You no, know, I, you know, I was going to do this. You can edit it out. But basically, <laughs> one of the reasons why I didn't stand in from this is the diagnostics of cat and angio got much better. And this, this is invaluable. But the other thing was probably more important to me. The inner observer reliability of this. We got the whole Shock Trauma Institute interested in the stuff. We all talked this language and everything. But if you put this out and put a lot of pelvic things out and ask people to classify it, the inner observer reliability, I don't think, is something that, that makes this stuff look as usable as I'd hoped. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. If you could unmute yourself and maybe My even. My wife has prayed for that. Yeah. yeah, I know. It seems like so long ago, right? <laughs> uh, there are no questions from the uh, peanut gallery, so to speak. I do have one for you. You mentioned there in the end uh, that one of the weaknesses was the reliability amongst providers once this was kind of disseminated to the orthopedic trauma population at large. Do you think the current iteration, which is the AO OTA classification that puts components of tiopenol in terms of rotational and vertical instability together with the descriptive classification that you developed, do you think that addresses the reliability that you alluded to there in the end of the weaknesses? Yeah, I got, let me give you a self-interested answer though. I think it does that, but I don't think it's as useful. And um, a, a B-type, Ta, Ta got a lot of pressure from Maurice Mueller. It was, you know, it's Pennell and his, you know, AP lateral compression. It was his, his and George Pennell's um, piece of work that we borrowed from. And um, if you're very interested in the acute treatment, in other words, what, what has taken the pelvis apart and how to assign associated injury, predict bleeding, and the need for aggressive pelvic intervention, that the B type uh, that is rotationally unstable but vertically stable, is that how a B is defined? I think so. Um, Correct, rotationally yeah. unstable, vertically They're stable. They're way different in their hemodynamics and and what they do, that, that's probably more valuable when you're called a few hours into the case to the ER and you become the, the, the mechanic that has to re, reconform the pelvis and fix it. I think that's helpful and it's good. We were very much in, I think part of what, what I described the scenario of us being very close and being in, involved in the resuscitation. I really wanted to look at a film that I, I sort of was trying to make that dramatic look from our room, walk in the door and say, type and cross them for six. I was the first one to say that because we had so many general surgeons, but the orthopods were only three in number. So we got to see these from a distance and, and interject ourselves in the first 20 minutes. And a, a type B doesn't do squat for me with regard to that, to be brutally frank. So 
self-interested, but I'm trying to be honest. On the other hand, O'Toole and my own guys that followed me at shock uh, kicked me in the, in the gut, but I think they were right. We, uh, I think everybody was using that classification because uh, they were trying not to embarrass me, maybe at shock, but it did work for us in those days. Thank you. I do have a question from the gallery, but I'm going to hold on that one so my colleagues can address it because it's kind of a little foreshadowing. It's about the amount of rotation that's acceptable for uh, uh, impact on gates. And I think that's going to be yeah, that's, a discussion for Dr. Saji and others once we get to that point. Yeah, I, I'm going to add a couple of things. If you got a second, just uh, bleeding yeah, into things. You can see some of the literature that's piled on in years to follow lateral, set, lateral compression. You just don't bleed much unless you're elderly. And all of a sudden you start pulling that group out and uh, ileos, ileolumbar and lateral sacral arteries start to bleed once the watershed of the internal iliac is sort of calcified. You know, I'm saying in my classification, that's a fairly forgiving thing because you're pressing it towards the midline. You won't break an artery because it's, I'm, most of my patients were fairly young. As elderly people start driving out into harm's way because their peripheral vision, they get, they get near side lateral impact. There are a whole different lead. The, the trouble with all of that stuff, that's fine tuning and you have to have, I, th I think, large numbers before you start to think like that. And that came with us over decades, not, not the first few years. I'll, I'll leave it at that. The main, main thing is, um, I don't think there's good inter observer reliability on what an AP or lateral compression is at least the way we defined it. And one, one last question. This is prompted from Dr. Saji. Uh, how do you use the classification then now? That is in, in current practice. We, we don't. We, uh, um, I thought this was good for us. Uh, there's no doubt that when CHIP arrived, we went to a different level of, um, of expertise and how to fix and how to deal with the pelvis. And this wasn't uh, the classification preferred at the center I'm at uh, presently. So I'm okay with it. So I don't use it now. Every time I see a pelvic one, I, I uh, put it in my own mind, but I don't think that appears in our charts very often. 